Hi, everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest tonight is Dr. Roy Artal. Dr. Artal is a multi-board certified specialist in pulmonology, sleep disorders, and internal medicine. He is a graduate of the UCLA School of Medicine, a clinical instructor of medicine at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine, and faculty of the Cedars-Sinai Medical Center Women's Guild Lung Institute Center of Excellence. His goal is to provide patients with the highest level of care, drawing from the best of both modern medicine and complementary approaches. Dr. Artal follows a whole food plant-based diet and recommends the same to his patient. So please welcome Dr. Artal. Thank you, AJ. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. So I'm very excited to interview you because I actually know you. <laughs> so we do know each other. That's right. I actually I actually go to you. And so I'm really excited to, to hear what you have to say about especially sleep because, you know, I mean, my grandfather graduated medical school in the 1920s, and I don't think they had that as a specialty back then. You know, it, it sure wasn't sleep medicine as, as a modern um field of discipline really emerged out of the 60s and 70s at Stanford University. And it, in, in, in terms of the history of medicine, that's, that's really uh, yesterday so, so, far as, so far as we're talking. So this is really a new discipline that a lot of physicians in training, a lot of physicians who are practicing today have never really had any training or experience in. So it's, it's exciting to be on this sort of field right. of medicine that's, that's, that's really on the cusp. But why why do we need it with all due respect? I mean, why we didn't used to, so why are people having so much trouble sleeping that we actually have to have a specialist now? Well, I I think that people are recognizing sleep as a critical function of human health. We talk about nutrition all the time. We talk about exercise all the time. We talk about cholesterol and all these different things. But, of course, sleep is, is so integral to, to our health. We, we spend at least a third of our life, if not more, sleeping. Each, each and every one of us knows how cruddy we feel if you don't sleep well the night before. And for, for people who suffer from chronic sleep disorders, whether it's sleep apnea or insomnia or, or difficulty sleeping from, from any number of reasons or whatnot, people suffer, and, and people are aware of that, and, and, and there's more recognition just how important sleep is for, for day-to-day health and happiness. Yeah, it's, it's amazing because, you know, like you're right, without sleep, it's like nothing matters. <laughs> you can't do anything. It, it sure doesn't. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, before we get started into this interesting field of sleep medicine and how you got into it, I want to know how you got into the plant-based diet because the way I heard about you, Dr. Artal, is I teach my monthly seminars and a young lady was in the class and I always ask everybody, well, you know, how did you hear about me? And she said, well, from my doctor. And I'm like, well, who's your doctor? And he goes, she goes, Dr. Roy Artal. He told me to watch Forks Over Knives and that got me to Dr. McDougall and I called them and they referred me to you. So apparently you actually not only recommend for your patients to see Forks Over Knives and follow a plant-based diet, you follow one yourself. And I'm curious to know because you went to UCLA and I'm pretty sure they weren't teaching you that much about nutrition. How did you yeah, get they into... Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. So t- tell everybody, how much nutrition did you get in, in medical school, four years of medical school? You know, my recollection is very little, unfortunately. You know, and mm. and, and and if there was, I'm sure it, it it sure wasn't following a whole food plant based diet. I'm <laughs> sure it would have, I'm sure it would have been the typical sort of food pyramid that we all right. kind of right. studied in school when 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 we were growing up. So, so how but, did you how did you even find out about the plant based diet and, and and change your diet yourself and then start recommending them to your patients for optimum health? Sure. You know, it's 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 an interesting story. You know, over years I was just generally dissatisfied to some extent practicing medicine and, and just always sort of questioning what, what real impact I have on, on the health and, and lives of my patients. And and I would see people who were 10 years older than me or 15 or 20 years older than me, but people, same profession, doctors, dentists, attorneys, professionals here in Los Angeles, people who, who exercise two, three, four, five times a week just like me, but they were all unhealthy. Mm. They, they, they all ate heart healthy salmon, and they were all eating their heart healthy <laughs> olive oil, and you know, e- eating their little bit of spinach on the side. But they were all getting high blood pressure, and they were all 10, 20, 30, 40 pounds overweight, and they were all on statins for their cholesterol, and they were getting heart attacks, and they were getting strokes, and y- y- you know, this this was concerning to me, and and it was and it was gnawing at me, and and finally, it it, it just prompted me, really out of out of self-concern, to, to to really just 
investigate this and, and, and do independent research and, and, and independent reading. And, and that prompted me really to just sit down and over the course of months just read dozens and dozens and dozens of, of, of medical literature, articles, books, journals, etc. And, and this was long before I'd ever heard the names Colin Campbell and, and uh, Dr. McGill. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's better now. Yeah, thanks. I was hearing like some some kids in the background. <laughs> so, so yeah, you, you know, so it, it it really just prompted me to to investigate this and and, and everything that I read pointed in, in the direction of, of a generally plant-based diet as being the optimal diet for, for human health. Lower rates of diabetes, lower rates of heart disease, stroke, cancer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so this is something that, that, again, I really adopted on my own before I'd, any, before I'd heard of any of these so-called rock stars of, of the plant-based medicine movement. And um, it, it was really a friend who, who, who I swim with on a, on a swim team who asked me about what I was doing with my diet because I'd, I'd lost some weight when I adopted this diet. said, boy, you know, it, it sure sounds like you're, you're following the Engine 2 diet. And, and, <laughs> and I said, well, gosh, you know, what's the Engine 2 diet? And he said, well, you know, it's, it's this great book. My, my brother-in-law wrote it. You should, or excuse me, my, uh, uh, my, my brother-in-law follows that diet. So I went out and ordered that book, and, and that introduced me, of course, to the, the big names in this field, Colin Campbell and, and Dr. McDougall and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and Chef AJ. And, and Chef AJ, most importantly. So, so that, really started, that really started me on this path. How long ago was that? This was, gosh, about five years ago now. Wow, that's terrific. And so, you know, I, I, you, didn't you say something to the effect of that when you started losing weight, your colleagues started worrying that maybe you had cancer or something because they don't recognize when somebody's a normal weight that that's normal? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, mean, I was even worried that I had cancer. Yeah, you know, I, <laughs> you know I, I, I lost probably 30, 40 pounds in this diet, and I was losing so much weight so fast. I, I was telling my wife, geez, you know, I, I think I want to I I I get an abdominal ultrasound to make sure I don't have pancreatic <laughs> cancer or something. I, I, I thought that I must have de developed pancreatic had a cancer at the exact same time and became a vegan. Oh, so, you know, and, and, and colleagues were stopping me in the hallways of the hospital asking me if I was okay. And <laughs> so it was, it, it was an interesting time. It was an interesting time, that's for sure. So it's been five years, and what are your colleagues saying now? Are they asking, are you still on that crazy diet, doctor? Yeah, am I still on that crazy diet? You know, wow. patients are still asking me if, if I'm still on that crazy diet. So, you know, it's um, funny. It, 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 it's funny, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to say that that along the way I've converted so many colleagues and so many patients onto this. And so and, and, and you and I have talked about this before. My, my, my goal is never to tell anyone, hey, that this is what you need to do and it's all or nothing. <laughs> the, the, the more plant-based nutrition and plant-based um, nutrients that somebody can introduce into their diet and, and use that to replace animal-based protein, I, I think, the, in my opinion, the evidence is very clear that you are going to be a healthier person, you're going to suffer from less chronic illness, and you're going to be a generally happier person. So um, that's that's been my partial mission as a physician, to, yeah. to, to really introduce this concept to, to my patients and colleagues. So up until recently when I started sending droves of people to you, I imagine most of your people that you saw were in there pretty much for lifestyle related diseases. What percentage of the people that you see do you think suffer from these diseases that could be prevented and reversed using a whole food plant-based diet? Sure. You know, so about, I would say 10 to 20% of my practice is internal medicine and the rest is pulmonary medicine and sleep medicine. Mm. And, and the majority of sleep medicine, the most common reason that people go to see a sleep doctor is sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And, and, and certainly the association between obesity and sleep apnea is huge. Yeah. Um, a, a thin person, a skinny person can certainly have sleep apnea and certainly can snore and whatnot, but absolutely no doubt that increasing rates of obesity are associated with increasing rates of sleep apnea. And similarly in pulmonary medicine, you see associations with with asthma and difficulty breathing with obesity. You see, uh, I, I work with a number of surgeons who, as, as a hospitalist, who do um, joint replacement surgery. Well, who are the people who typically need to have hip and knee replacements? Mm -hmm. Generally, it's people who are, who are overweight yeah. and obese. Certainly not always, but, right. but, but, but the majority of the patients. So you, you see so many disease associations between nutrition and obesity and diet and, and the choices that people make at home and the illnesses that they, that they 
present to the physician with. Right. Now, that's that's pretty impressive. You're quadruple board certified. I mean, that's so what do you have to do? Like, how did you even decide to pick those four specialties? And what do you have to do? Like, take the boards in every single one of those specialties? Yeah. So, so physician training, you, you graduate from medical school and then, you, and then you do a residency in a specific discipline. And that discipline, in my case, was internal medicine. Um, somebody can do a, a surgery residency, somebody can do a pediatrics residency, a psychiatry residency, and so on. And then if you choose to, you can subspecialize after your residency. And that, for instance, is, is, is how one becomes a cardiologist or how one mm-hmm. becomes a gastroenterologist or, in my case, a pulmonologist. Mm-hmm. And so I did a pulmonary fellowship after my internal, internal medicine residency, actually a pulmonary critical care fellowship. And at the end of that fellowship, or during that fellowship, I should say, I was offered the opportunity to do additional training in sleep medicine, which I was interested in because I was a neurobiology or, or, or psychobiology major mm-hmm. as an undergraduate in college. So, so the brain and, and neurobiology was always was always a fascination of mine. And in finishing my fellowship, I was at that time quadruple board certified in internal medicine, critical care medicine, pulmon- pulmonology, and in sleep medicine. And and the way it works nowadays, at least in in internal medicine subspecialties, is you have to recertify your board examination every ten years. Mm. And and nowadays I do such little critical care medicine. I decided to not recertify in that. So oh, today no. I'm only board certified in three fields. Oh not, no, not, not the four. I'm sorry, AJ. I let you <laughs> That's down. Okay. Well, because I was going to say, with emergency medicine, you could you'd always have a job because even even vegans sometimes fall down and need to go to the emergency room. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> so you know, with with sleep. Uh, so many people that I know of, not necessarily people my age, but like my friends' parents, they're they're on Ambien and they're on it right. and they never get off it. Right. What can people do so they don't go down that road of getting on sleep meds that they can never get off? Well, I I, th- I think the first thing is don't start. Right. Um, just like smoking, right? It's, it's it, easier. It, it, it's easier. You don't have to quit if you never start. It's just it's just you know I, I see. I see college age students and, and young adults all the time who, who, who come back to town from where, wherever they are in the country and they come back to, to be with mom and dad for the summer. And a lot, of these, a lot of these young people have difficulty sleeping and are stressed out with school and exams and, and chronic insomnia. And, and we talk about drugs and we talk about medications. And my, my advice to all of them is, is look, you know, you, you're, you're an 18, 20, 21 year old kid Hopefully, you're going to have many, many, many more decades of life ahead of you. If we start you on a nightly habit now, what do you think the likelihood is of you getting off of that medicine mm-hmm. after, after 5, 10, 20 years of, of consistent use? Not, not very high. Right. All of these medicines are, are fine for, for sporadic use. They're fine for intermittent use. Everyone has, has, has a difficult night sleeping once in a while, including me. And, and and if one chooses to use these medications to help with that episodic insomnia, I think that's I think that's perfectly okay. Th- there are people who just for the life of them are not able to sleep without medication, and yeah. um, there are. That's not to say that they couldn't sleep without medication, but they have a very very difficult time without it. I would say for me as a sleep doctor, considering the. I don't even know how many hundreds of patients I treat with insomnia. I have comparatively very, very few patients on, on chronic medication therapy for insomnia with drugs such as Ambien. It's, okay. it's, it's something that, that, that I generally try to, try to prescribe or, or, or get into really as a last resort. Do you think that for at least some, if not maybe all of these people, that if they adopted better lifestyle habits such as maybe exercising or eating a healthier diet, maybe not drinking so much coffee or alcohol that maybe they'd have an easier time with sleep? For sure. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no doubt about that. When, when I counsel somebody about insomnia, we, we really talk about the sort of three different treatment paradigms that exist for insomnia. And, and, and those three general paradigms are, number one is pharmacotherapy that we've, that we've touched on a little bit. The second is what we call sleep hygiene or sleep hygiene optimization. And sleep hygiene is, is this medical term that the doctors use that, that refer to the behaviors that we engage in in and around sleep that, that either help or hinder getting a good night's sleep. So for example, drinking a double espresso at bedtime, not good sleep hygiene. Okay. Getting into a debate with your spouse or significant other about the mortgage or issues like that right before bedtime, not a good idea. 
trying to relax, trying to meditate in the hour or two before you go to bed, perfect. Trying to mm-hmm. maintain consistent sleep and wake times, that's probably one of the most important factors. I, I, I see so many people who, who stick to one sleep schedule from Sunday night through Thursday night, and then come the weekend, Friday and Saturday, go to bed three or four hours later and sleep mm-hmm. in until 12 o'clock noon the next day. So they're, they're constantly jet-lagging themselves, either yeah. advancing their sleep phase or delaying their sleep phase. That's, that's a really common um, self-defeating behavior that I see people engaging in. So a lot of sleep hygiene is common sense, but a lot of people don't recognize that what they're doing is problematic. And, and, and that's where oftentimes we're able to maybe shine a light on certain mm-hmm. behaviors that people get into to, to help them adjust and modify those behaviors. And then the third treatment paradigm for insomnia that I recommend almost universally to all of my patients is what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm-hmm. And, and cognitive behavioral therapy is a, is, a psych, is a psychology treatment paradigm. It's not just used as, for insomnia. It can be used for anxiety or for any number of, of, of concerns that, that one might have. But it's basically focusing on, focusing on, as the name implies, the cognitive and behavioral aspects of, of, of one approaching a, a certain issue or, or concern. In, in this case, of course, we're talking about insomnia. And cognitive behavioral therapy, if you look at the data, equivalent results to pharmacotherapy, equivalent results certainly to Ambien. Um, uh, obviously, it's non-pharmacologic. It's non-habit forming, and it's, it's, a, it's a lifelong um, it, it provides tools that one can apply to other other aspects of one's life. So, so there's really nothing to be to be lost by trying it. Well, I love that medication is not your first line of defense, like so many other physicians. That you do do it, but you do it judiciously, and it's it's not the first thing you pull out of your bag of tricks. So, thank you for that. You know, what about some of the modern day uh, conveniences that um, I, I affect people's sleep, like having televisions in the bedroom or, or having their iPhone right there playing words with friends, sure. you know, artificial lights? What about those kind of things? How do they impact our ability to get sleep and get g- good quality sleep? Sure. Well, it's problematic. We, we know that light can be used therapeutically to delay sleep onset. So, for example, that's where we employ therapeutic use of light panels. There, there are people who, we've just talked about insomnia, and people have a difficult time initiating sleep. But, but there's also the opposite problem, people who fall asleep too, too soon, too early uh, yeah. in, in the evening. So light can be used therapeutically to delay sleep onset. But, of course, light is also going to have an impact in, in anyone who's exposed to a bright light right in front of their face. So it, it's going to delay the the um, 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 impetus and the momentum to sleep, televisions, bright lights in the bedroom, laptops, tablets, smartphones, et cetera, that, that one is holding literally inches from one's face, oftentimes in a dark room, are going to have a negative impact. Uh-huh. So, so patients said, are definitely encouraged to limit that, especially right. if they suffer from insomnia. Well, we have no electronics in our bedroom, and we've got rid of the TV, and that's that's just the rule, and that seems to really help. And do you think that having things like, you know, darker curtains or those blackout curtains or wearing a sleep mask, any of those things ever beneficial for some people? Sure, for sure, yeah, especially people who live in live in a big city like you and I do. Huh? Um, um, uh, outdoor lights or, or if somebody has a regular hours or, or non-traditional sleep hours, they should say, because of their job, maybe they – they don't get home from work until one or two in the morning, and, and they do need to sleep in later in the day until well after the sun has risen. So blackout curtains are going to be important for that individual to to really maintain a darkened sleep environment to allow them to get the seven hours or so of sleep that, that, that everyone should be getting. Well, so so you mentioned seven hours. Now, is that, is that the number we should shoot for, or does everyone have a different amount that they need to to sleep to see satiation to feel refreshed? Mm-hmm. Yeah, or is there great. a minimum? And, and is there a maximum? Can you sleep too much? Sure, great question. You know, it's, it's, it's sleep quantity is going to be very individual. Mm-hmm. What we know from some studies that have, that, that have looked at optimal duration of sleep, it's really the extremes of sleep that seem to get people into, into problems. And, and when I say extremes of sleep, really sleeping less than four hours or, or mm. sleeping more than 10 hours per, mm. per 24-hour period seem to be associated. And again, I say seem. I don't want any, any of your listeners to freak out, but it seemed to be associated with slightly uh, increased mortality related to mm-hmm. both cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular disease. The, the specific causes of that are, are not entirely clear, but what we do see is that there's a U-shaped curve. 
that the sweet spot in terms of health and, and longevity seems to be at the bottom of that U-shaped curve when, you, when you're kind of really between four and ten hours with, with, with the nadir, with, with, with the optimum, optimum amount of sleep being right at about seven hours. Wow. That's not to say that if you sleep six hours and, or five hours and you feel great, there's a problem with that. And conversely, if you sleep eight or nine hours and, and that's what you need, then, then great. That's what you should continue to do. But it's, it's people who really suffer with either spending just inordinate amounts of time in bed over 10 hours. That, that really mm. probably warrants a discussion with your physician about why yeah. you're so sleepy and why you need to sure. spend so much time in bed. Well, well, how do you know if you've slept to satiation or how do you know if you've had adequate sleep, not just in duration, but like, is, is there a test for it? You just wake up feeling refreshed or is, you know, how do you, how do you know? You know, my very unscientific litmus test mm -hmm. is that if you feel the need, if, if you show up in my office, if, if you've gone to the trouble to search me out and make an appointment with a sleep doctor and, and come to my building, that there's a problem with your sleep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, that, so, that's, so that's a very unscientific lit, litmus test for, for the sure. people who see me. But, you know, in, in, in terms, of course, the people who are at home and, you know, listening to this, you, you shouldn't worry about your sleep. Sleep is one of those things that's just supposed to happen naturally, and mm -hmm. you should feel good when you wake up. You should be able to fall asleep relatively effort-free. You should be able to sleep through the night. For the most part, waking up a handful of times a night is is, is is not uncommon at all and, and mm -hmm. shouldn't worry people. But if, if you're waking up more than two or three times a night and if you're having difficulty going back to sleep, that might be worth a conversation with your physician. And when you wake up in the morning, you should feel, you should feel generally pretty okay. And, and you should have good energy to, to go about your, your business and, and, and your work and, and your playtime during the day without being excessively sleepy, without falling asleep at work meetings, certainly, God forbid, without falling asleep behind the wheel. Yes. So, oh. Well, how do you feel about naps? I mean, should we need them? Or I mean, or only babies take naps? You know, I'm I'm actually a big proponent of naps, and um, I I think a a, a post lunch or an early afternoon short power nap, 15 mm -hmm. to 20 minutes, is great. Yeah. There's there's plenty of data out there so demonstrating decreased stress hormones and, and 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 improved energy and improved concentration with people who take short naps. But I, I really emphasize short naps because what happens when you sleep longer than about 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you, you develop what's called sleep inertia. And sleep inertia is this term that basically means that you, you have a hard time coming out of the, the sleep. And even though you might be awake and, and going about your business, that then you're just going to be dragging and you, you, your brain is going to be kind of yearning for more sleep that that it got a little whiff of it with your long with your long nap and then and then you've taken that opportunity away and 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 then you're just going to be dragging the rest of the day. So I think a short 15 20 minute power nap is great and and what I would tell people who are listening is that the ability to take a nap is an acquired skill and ah. to to be able to sit down in your in your office or in your cubicle or in your home when, when there's light on outside and to be able to close your eyes and to try to turn off all the noise and all the turmoil that exists around us in our daily 21st century lives and to, and to clear your mind of all of that stuff and, and to allow your body to sleep for 15 minutes is, is for sure an acquired skill. Mm. And, um, well, I think I, I've, ma I think I've mastered that. I don't, I don't nap, <laughs> but I don't, I don't lay down in my bed and nap. But what I do is every afternoon I take my dog out when it's sunny to also get my vitamin D and we sit on a little blanket and he sits in the shade and I sit in the sun. There's something about the sun that I can just get so relaxed and I can close my eyes and sleep for about 10 or 15 minutes. So I kind of think that's a nap in a way. For sure. For sure. And, that, and I wake up feeling refreshed and rejuvenated. Are there preferred hours to sleep? Like, I, I mean, our ancestors, they probably had to go to bed when the sun came down because there were no electric lights. And if they didn't hide in the cave, they could get eaten. So it seems like they probably went to bed whenever the sun went down. But now we have artificial light. And, right. But does it matter what the hours we sleep or as long as we get enough? You know, it, it, some of both. The, the, the majority of us are going to sleep with are, are going to sleep during what we call socially conforming times, meaning that most of us are expected to go to sleep sometime between ten and eleven because of societal norms and social mm -hmm. norms and and many of us live with 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 one or more other people and 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 that's when 
typically most people want to go to bed, so, so we like to be good partners and, and, and housemates and roommates and whatnot and, 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 and try to accommodate those societal norms. But, but also most of us have to be at work 7, 8, 9 o'clock the next morning. So yeah. for, for us to get that seven, eight hours of sleep that, that most of us desire, that most of us need and crave, we really have to be in bed by a certain hour. In, yeah. in my case, I wake up pretty early in the morning to, 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 to work out if, if, if I can. I, I try to do that most days. So for me to get that seven hours of sleep, I really need to be in bed by 9, 9.30. Otherwise, I'm going to be hurting the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, but society really dictates the hours that we sleep. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. With artificial light, we could really sleep whenever we wanted to. Yeah, could stay up all night, go to Vegas, you know? You know, it's it's funny because I, I, when I used to be a respiratory therapist, I I mean, I, there were, you know, every now and then I'd be on call to work the night shift. I always pray, please don't call me because I don't understand how these people can work the night shift. It just seems like it would be so difficult on your body to be awake when the world is sleeping and be asleep when the world is awake. Is there any studies or anything, you know, about people, these, these shift workers, is it harder on your body when you're not sleeping when everybody else is? For sure, unfortunately, um, shift work is in epidemiologic studies has been associated with all sorts of chronic diseases. Oh, and, boy. and um, you know, so I, I always advise my patients to, who, who are shift workers, look, at, so many of us have to do what we have to do in order to, to make ends meet, and, and, and those are, um, you know, and, that, and that's the situation that we find ourselves in. But I, I always advise all of my shift work patients that if you have the opportunity to, to get into a regular daytime, nighttime schedule to, mm-hmm. to, to pursue that and, and, and to take that opportunity. Do, does the amount of sleep we need, Dr. Artal, vary as we age? Because it seems like babies sleep all the time. And yet when I was an activity director or retirement home, the seniors, I mean, they would like, you know, they'd be eating dinner four or five and then they'd want to go to bed, but then they, they really couldn't stay asleep more than four or five hours. And they all seem to be on these medications. So does the amount of sleep we need change as we age? The, the amount of sleep, once we enter adulthood, the amount of sleep that we obtain per 24 hours tends to not change so much, but your observation is absolutely correct that the sleep tends to be non-contiguous. Mm-hmm. So whereas an adult may, may obtain, we've been talking about seven to eight hours of sleep, and, and they may obtain the bulk of that in, in one continuous stretch, a senior may, may obtain that in, in bits and pieces, a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe up for a couple of hours during the night, a nap during the day, and so forth. And it can be very frustrating. It can be very frustrating if, if, if the spouse doesn't, doesn't share that sleep pattern. It can be frustrating, if, um, it can be frustrating for, for the individual themselves that they, mm-hmm. they don't want to be awake for two, three hours during the middle of the night. And it's, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a tough situation without easy solutions. So if we if if we find ourselves waking up for two or three hours, do you suggest we go read a book or 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 try to go back to sleep or take a pill? What what do you how do you advise people with, that have let's say that this if, if this is a, if this is every night it's different, but let's say occasionally that that were to happen. Well, I mean, for for something like that to happen occasionally, you know, that that happens to all of us. It, hap- it happens to me once in a while. I'm sure it happens to you once in a while. Mm-hmm. I, I, th- I think it really just depends on, I, I think most of us know when we wake up in the middle of the night, is this going to be a, a short awakening where we're going to be able to tough it out and, and, and be back asleep within 30 minutes if, if we just lay in bed and try to clear our minds? Or are you just wide awake and it's time to get up and, and start answering emails? Oh, well, it seems like the only time I wake up is to pee. Is there anything we can do about that as we age? I try not to drink anything after noon, but what what goes on with our bodies that makes us have to pee in the middle of the night? Well, the thing that's, of, of course, that, w- that we all think about, at least in men, is prostatic enlargement and prostatic hypertrophy. In 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 women, women tend to the, the, the bladders tend to become a little bit more sensitive and, and they're able to hold less urine, so, so, so the bladder has to be emptied more regularly. Mm-hmm. But the, the hidden cause of nocturia that, that most people and even many physicians I find are not aware of is sleep apnea. And, yeah. and w- one, of the, one of the major symptoms of sleep apnea that I, that I see in my patients is the need to urinate repeatedly through the night. Interesting. And, of, and oftentimes when somebody is referred to me for a sleep apnea evaluation, I'll ask them, this is a routine question of mine, how many times do you get up per night to urinate? And if somebody says three, four, five, six times per night, my ears always peak up a little bit. 
Wow. And, and, and oftentimes I'll hear men say, yeah, but, you know, it makes no sense because I've been to the urologist and they say that my prostate is normal sized. And I, and I always say, well, I know why you're getting up to pee all night long. And then once we treat their sleep apnea, that's actually one of the ways that we track the success of the treatment is I'd like to see them having to get up to urinate really, if possible, no more than once per night. Wow. And, and, and oftentimes we're able to achieve that. Just in case somebody listening doesn't know, and I'm not exactly really sure what it is either, what is sleep apnea? I know the people that have it always seem to have to wear those masks, but I'm not really sure what it is. Sure. So uh, so there there are two types of sleep apnea. There is obstructive sleep apnea, which is about 99% of, of the cases of sleep apnea out there, and, and, and I'll define that in a moment. Central sleep apnea is, is exceedingly rare. Um, uh, is it, central sleep apnea is basically your brain forgetting to tell your body to take a breath. Of, of course, we breathe without thinking about it. We don't, have to, we, we don't sit there with a stopwatch and time ourselves and say every, every five seconds or eight seconds, whatever it is, I'm going to, I'm going to intentionally take a breath. We, we do that, what's called from our autonomic nervous system. Our, our brain automatically tells us to take a breath. Well, sometimes those, those neurologic mechanisms don't work correctly and, and the brain will basically forget to tell our bodies to take a breath. So, so there might be a prolonged period of time, 10, 20, 30 seconds, in which you're just not breathing. But how would a person know this, and, and, and how long can you not breathe until you die? I mean, I mean, it sounds like it's a serious disease. Well, the, 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 the brain typically will rescue you out of that. So at some point, the brain will recognize that you're not taking a breath, and the brain will initiate a breath to, to maintain oh. oxygenation and, mm -hmm. and to maintain your carbon dioxide levels and so forth. Obstructive sleep apnea is a very different entity, and the, the way that I describe obstructive sleep apnea to my patients is that the walls of the throat are formed by about a dozen pairs of very small muscles, and during the day when we're awake, those muscles are in a state of tonic contraction, so we have this nice, stiff, wide-open air passage to breathe through. When we go to sleep at night, muscle tone to all the muscles in the body goes down as the brain drifts into sleep. And those throat muscles get soft and floppy. So, and, and, and everyone virtually, the throat will contract down or shrink down to some smaller size, but ordinarily there should still be plenty of an opening for air to move in and out of without any difficulty. But in some people, due to anatomic considerations or excess weight, the throat might completely collapse or pancake shut in itself when those muscles relax. It would be no different than if somebody were, were sleeping and somebody were to come up to their bed and clasp their hand over somebody's mouth and nose. Mm. So, so, so the effort to breathe is actually continuing, but the, the air passage itself is actually obliterated shut or collapsed shut. The definition of an apnea event is a 10-second or longer pause in breathing. Mm. And in, in somebody with severe sleep apnea, somebody can, can have literally hundreds of apneas per night. Wow. Now, the reason why people with sleep apnea don't suffocate to death in their sleep is that after the apnea goes on long enough, again, the brain at some point will register that, hey, there's a problem, we're not breathing here, we're not getting oxygen to our bodies. The brain will trigger a mini awakening, which is really just enough of an awakening to get those throat muscles to contract and open up so you catch your breath again. You, 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 you take your recovery breaths, the brain says, okay, everything's back to normal, the brain goes back down to sleep again, the throat muscles relax again, and the cycle repeats itself. Wow. And so what those, and so I guess either they they have a partner that notices this or they figure out that something's going on and that's when they, they seek your help. Right. So bed partners, spouses are, are my number one referral source. Uh -huh. um, uh, loud snoring, um, the bed partner actually observes pauses in breathing. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody's single or they don't have an observant bed partner or, or, or they sleep alone in the bedroom, um, people wake up tired. Okay. People that's... say to me all the time, I wake up just as tired as when I, as when I went to bed the ah. night before. People are tired and exhausted during the day. People are falling asleep in places that they shouldn't be falling asleep. People wake up with headaches. Mm -hmm. I have plenty of patients that I've seen whose only symptom, literally the, the, the only symptom they've had is headaches for years and years and years, morning headaches. Morning headaches is a key. And wow. They, they swear that they're not tired. They swear that they don't snore, but they have morning headaches. We study them, and, and so many times we, we find sleep apnea. We treat the sleep apnea, and miraculously the headaches go away. So is snoring is always a symptom of sleep apnea? Or are there people that snore that don't have sleep apnea? Great question. So most people who have sleep apnea snore, but for sure, absolutely 
not everyone who snores has sleep apnea. You should really think of think of it as a as a as, as two problems on the same continuum. Snoring tends not always, but but tends to be a sign of a constricted airway, whereas sleep apnea is a really constricted or completely occluded airway. Okay. So they they tend to be on the same continuum, but certainly not everyone who snores has sleep apnea. So I don't I don't want anyone who's listening to get worried that they have sleep apnea just because they snore. Sure. And how do you, would you even know you snore unless somebody tells you? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, <laughs> um, the, 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 there are apps now that are being developed for our, for our smartphones that I, I know patients are always showing me all the time that uh-huh. that they can rec- – it's a audio-triggered um, or, or noise-triggered recording. So people can set these little apps to, to record – whether or not they're making any noise at nighttime when they sleep. So, so even somebody who lives alone or who doesn't have a roommate or, or a partner can can record themselves with with these apps and 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 determine if they sleep and or determine if they snore. Excuse me. And and certainly if somebody snores and and has some of these other symptoms like daytime sleepiness or high blood pressure or diabetes, that should probably prompt a discussion with your physician about being evaluated for sleep apnea. Interesting. Well, how does being overweight or obese predispose the patient to having the sleep apnea? Well, as, as you know, AJ, when when one is overweight, fat or adipose tissue gets deposited everywhere in the body. Uh, it, doesn't, it, sure. doesn't, it, it, does, it doesn't just get deposited in, in the belly or the, or the thighs or the midsection. Mm-hmm. So adipose tissue gets deposited in, in the neck and around the throat as well. So there's more weight on the outside of the throat, which when those throat muscles relax, that excess weight will lead to, it's just more external weight, more external pressure that tends to predispose the airway to collapse. And so you've seen people when they have lost weight, preferably through a whole food plant-based diet, actually get rid of these machines and, and reverse their sleep apnea? Oh, for sure. We, we, we see that all the time. I've, I've had tons great. of patients, tons of patients who have who've been able to put their CPAP machine away in the closet just, just by weight loss alone. That is fantastic. You know, I, I remember I used to love the show, The X Files, and there was one episode where there was somebody in the military, and like he just couldn't sleep. And it seems like if you couldn't sleep, you would want you would go crazy. And I think of Michael Jackson, which is one of the most severe examples of somebody that couldn't sleep. If he was your patient, what could you have done? Could you have helped him? You know, because that was pretty drastic. The measures he took to sleep. Yeah. Well, you know, I. I what can you say about that? What a tragedy! You know, such, yeah. such a talented guy. But you know, I, I think uh, uh, with, without getting into the specific, specifics of that case, I mean, I, you know, obviously you you you, you approach in, insomnia, whether it's mild or severe, with, with 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 much the same paradigms. And you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, behavior modification. You know, and 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 in some people, um, um, medications. Pharmacotherapy is, is is absolutely appropriate, um, you know. But I, I've certainly would have a hard time thinking of of, of, of any insomnia patient that that we've seen over the years that, that we haven't been able to 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 help in any way, shape, or form. And Good. and 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 sometimes um, sometimes people value insight into their condition more than anything else. And Sometimes we're not able to make the insomnia go away. We're not able to help them without medications or sometimes even with medications. Um, many people I find are resistant to medications. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's something that, that I see quite regularly, people who are, who are very resistant to these medications. But but what they're really looking for is insight into their condition. They're, they're, they're looking for insight into the mechanisms of sleep and the mechanisms of insomnia. And, and just like many years ago, Freud... Sigmund Freud talked about the talking cure. People find it very helpful, very beneficial to talk about their problems. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think just for somebody who's, who's suffered from insomnia chron- chronically to be able to go in and speak with a physician and, 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 and have an intelligent discussion about it and, and perhaps be recommended one or two book titles that they could go and do some independent study and some independent research really helps people to feel empowered. You know, knowledge is empowerment, and and ultimately that's what we're really trying to offer our patients is is both knowledge and empowerment into their condition. Have you ever um, heard of hypnotherapy being used for for this condition? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, Hypnotherapy, meditation, acupuncture, you you know, there are many complementary approaches which which have been um, which have been studied and which have shown benefit with with insomnia. So uh, I I just... um, 
uh, saw a patient the other day who, who who's um, en- enrolling in a uh, meditation program as, 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 a, as, a, as a treatment paradigm for their insomnia. So I, I definitely applaud people who, who, who pursue those types of those types of approaches. Yeah. It's so funny because I've been trying so hard for years to be a regular meditator, and every time I meditate, whether it's morning, noon, or night, I fall asleep, so I can really see how meditation <laughs> could be useful. I guess I'm just one of these lucky, blessed people that can fall asleep anytime, anywhere, and I'm just very thankful for that. But at the few times that I can't fall asleep, I have this little thing. I, I know we're not supposed to have technology in the bedroom, and I don't use it to check email, but I have it on my iPad, and it's called Delta Waves, and, and I just Googled how to fall asleep fast, and it's free, and it it, it plays these sounds, and I swear, I, I mean, I, it knocks me out like a light very quickly. Well, I'll tell you what, AJ, I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down, and I'm gonna. I'll, 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 I'll I'm, I'm, think I'm that gonna... I because it's amazing. It's like if I put it on too late in the morning, I can't. It's hard for me to wake up. It's that powerful. I'm gonna send you the link I use. It's Please amazing. do. Yeah, well, I'll share it with my patients. I, I love it. So you know, I've always wondered about this, Doctor Artal. Does every species and organism sleep, and what is the purpose of sleep? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, believe it or not, we have no idea what the purpose of sleep is. <laughs> we have no idea what the purpose of sleep is. Theories abound. Um, th- th- there, there are many good theories, um, um, uh, probably some elements of truth with, with several of those theories. But at the end of the day, we really don't understand, believe it or not, why we sleep. Um, there's, there's theories involving... Uh, uh, regeneration. There's theories uh, in, in, uh, uh, involving uh, uh, that toxic substances accumulate in the brain, and that sleep purges the brain of those substances. Uh, yeah, I, I could list a number of others, but uh, we really don't have a clear idea why people sleep. But what we do know, though, is that all mammals sleep without exception. There's mm. there's not a single mammalian species, uh, to, to my knowledge, um, and, and from and from my reading in the past, that doesn't sleep. Even, even ocean mammals, dolphins, whales, who, who uh, um, of course, need to sleep but also need to not drown uh, in, in the ocean, they, they've developed this adaptive mechanism by which one, the, the, the two hemispheres of their brain alternate between sleep and wakefulness. So one hemisphere of their brain is awake and one hemisphere of their brain is asleep. Wow, and the two that's... alternate back, back and forth. So they maintain some level of consciousness, but yet they're still developed. Yet, yet they're still obtaining the physiologic benefit of sleep. That's fascinating. I, I, I just saw some dolphins when I was in the Cayman Islands. They are just so cool. They're they are the, cool. They are the coolest uh, uh, things. Do you ever see people for sleepwalking, or even what I think is more rare, people that eat in their sleep? I mean, is that real? I mean, because that really that could derail your diet. I mean, if if you didn't, <laughs> if you were trying to you know lose some weight and you had this, what is it? Is it a different condition, sleepwalking and sleep eating, and and how rare is it? It's, it you see it on the movies, and I actually have a friend that does it, but I've never seen her do it. Um, what is it? What causes that? And is, is there a cure? Because if you're trying to diet and you're eating in the middle of the night, not even knowing it, that's 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 not so good. Yeah, those those absolutely are real conditions. Fortunately, they're they're relatively rare. Um, there there are sleeping medications that that can provoke some of those reactions. So, um, for for example, that's that's not an uncommon reaction. Oh, I shouldn't say that's not uncommon. That that, that that's an infrequent reaction to Zolpidem or Ambien, um, and and that class of medications. But it's it's definitely a characterized. Uh, uh, reaction to um, sedative to sedative hypnotic medications in general, not just Ambien. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's definitely a side effect that we recognize. Uh, but it, it can certainly happen in the absence of, of using those medications, and it, it's a general condition that, that we call parasomnias, which is basically uh, uh, um, uh, behaviors or, or, or unwanted activities which which take place which emerge out of sleep. Uh, the, the, there are a number of triggers to, to parasomnias, whether we're talking about sleepwalking, whether we're talking about sleep eating, um, uh, um, kind of yelling, shouting, verbalizing um, it, during the night out of sleep. Major triggers for those behaviors include irregular sleep or insufficient sleep. So oftentimes you'll see people tend to spike these types of behaviors when there's stress at work or stress in the home or they're getting less sleep or if it's a younger person during finals week or in the, or in the weeks leading up to finals week, things like that are going to be major triggers. Sleep apnea is, is a significant trigger for, for many of these parasomnia-type 
behaviors that, that emerge out of sleep. So when we see somebody with these, with these behaviors, we always evaluate them for, for sleep apnea. Um, so they go to your lab, right? You have a lab, right, where people sleep over and you, right. you watch yeah. them, don't you? Yeah. So, so That so sounds like fun, sleep. actually. <laughs> I mean, you, you, yeah, you I should mean, come I, over I and know. try it sometime, AJ. <laughs> no, I, I, love doing, I love doing, you know, unique things like that. So when you have one of these people, is it best not to wake them up? Or can, you, can they get scared or can they get hurt doing these sleep eating things? You know, I, I think if, if somebody so, – so people definitely can be hurt engaging in sleepwalking, and, and some people will even engage in violent behavior during sleepwalking, not, not violent directed at, at, at other people per se, but, but injuring themselves, falling down a flight of stairs or Jeez. punching a wall or punching a mirror. And I've, I've certainly had any number of patients over the years who have, who have presented to me following – breaking a hand or breaking a leg or, or, or hmm. breaking, you know, breaking an arm from, from punching something or, 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 or cutting or lacerating themselves during their sleep. So this obviously can be very frightening to, to the patient as well as to family members. So um, de- depending on the cause, there, th- there are different treatments. Um, uh, sometimes it's treated with medication. Sometimes it's treated with sleep hygiene or treating sleep apnea. Mm. Do you think that carnivores need more sleep? And I say this because, um, you know, I've been vegan for almost 40 years, but two of those years, I actually was on a raw vegan diet. And it was like, I didn't need any sleep when I was wow. just eating food raw. It was crazy. It was like, almost like just too intense. And, you know, m- the people that I know that eat a lot of uh, high fat diet, a lot of animal products, they seem to need a lot more sleep than myself, my husband and our friends. And, and when I look at the animal kingdom, the very large carnivores, the tigers and the lions, they sleep all day compared to, you know, the ones that are, 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 are herbivorous. So are, do you know any data on that, if, if people that follow a plant-based diet actually need less sleep? You know, good question. I, I actually do not know the answer to that question off the top of my head. Well, let's, let's do I'll a study. I'll take on that one. And I wonder, are there any studies that correlate, you know, sleep or quality of sleep with longevity that you know of? Not specifically that question. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with that data. It may be out there, but I'm not personally yeah. familiar I'm with it. I'm just curious because, you know, people, I think that it doesn't, you know, everybody, like you said at the beginning of the call, everybody says you got to eat right, you got to exercise, but we don't really talk about sleep and how important it is. What it's, you, it's you, certainly sleep length and longevity, that data uh, is out there, but in, but in terms right. of quality as a subjective so assessment, I'm, I'm not sure about that specific question. Interesting. Okay. Well, how do you feel in general about things like coffee and alcohol, and how do you feel that, about them, you know, as as they relate to a person's maybe insomnia and um sure. yeah great question so caffeine has a we can talk about that first caffeine has a half life of about 6 hours so if you have a a drink that has 200 milligrams of caffeine in it at 2 p.m. you're still going to have 100 milligrams of your system at 8 p.m. and mm-hmm. 6 hours later you're still going to have 50 or 60 milligrams of, of caffeine in your system so the, the the coffee or the the cola or whatnot that you're ha- that you're having in the early afternoon or with lunch is still definitely going to be sticking around in your system toward the evening when you're probably trying to get into bed and initiate sleep. Okay. My general advice to people who suffer from insomnia is don't consume any caffeine. Just just yeah. take it out of your system. Right. Um, well, it's a drug, isn't it? I mean, the doctor I work with, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, who I've interviewed twice on this show, uh, you know, he's not a fan of it or, or chocolate because he feels it's a highly addictive central nervous system yeah. drug. And, you know, I travel every week and when you go to the airport and, you know, the line to go to the restroom is long, but the longest line is always the Starbucks. And it's like people right. cannot get through a day without coffee, it seems. so many. It seems like so many people that I know, they start their day with one drug, coffee. And they end it with the other drug, alcohol, almost like kind of to balance it out, you know. For and sure, I just, for sure. I, I mean, that's not. I mean, that's a very accurate observation. Yeah. Alcohol is not the friend of sleep. Alcohol yeah. is is good at helping people initiate sleep, um, mm. and and then it typically causes sleep fragmentation. So so what you what you see is reductions in sleep latency for the first part of the night, and sleep latency is is basically a medical term that means how long it takes you to fall asleep. Interesting. So alcohol does tend to reduce so-called sleep latency, but then it tends to lead to subsequent disruptions disruptions of sleep architecture in the second half of the night and leads to what we call sleep maintenance insomnia the second half of the night. So there's sleep initiation insomnia, which is the ability to, to, to fall asleep, and there's sleep maintenance insomnia, which is the ability to stay asleep. So alcohol tends to disrupt the sleep maintenance 
I'm uh, or, so or just to lead, I'm, I should say, to sleep maintenance and something. I'm so glad you're you're saying these things because I tell people that all the time, but they don't believe me because I'm not a doctor that uh, co- uh, that alcohol and coffee are not. Well, you know. I'm going to give you an honorary degree right now. So. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's funny. I was speaking in Alaska a couple of years ago. I'd never been there. It's a beautiful state, by the way, if you haven't been there. And I was there in August. And it doesn't get dark there in August till like midnight. And without the cue of getting dark, I, that was the only time in my life I had trouble falling asleep because it never got dark, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. Was just, it, was, it was really, really weird, you know? So... Anyway, that's interesting, I thought. So, what, what, like, you know, I don't really have that much trouble sleeping at all, especially if I'm tired. But, you know, I do tend to worry. Is it, how, do you, how do you not worry? Because it seems that when you go to bed at night, that's the time that you start worrying because you're not busy. You're, you know, you're done with your activities. There's no more TV. That seems like when you really start ruminating about all the, like you say, the mortgage and all the things. So, again, would it be the cognitive behavioral therapy or you have any other tips and tricks how we can just delay worrying to the waking hours yeah you, you know it, it's tough it's tough even it's tough even for uh for, for doctors like me right. and and it's something that it, it's something that takes training it, it really does take work and, and whether the mechanism is cognitive behavioral therapy or training at meditation or relaxation yoga or a stretching routine that people do in the evenings before they go to bed people have to learn how to train the, their their brain and and, mm-hmm. and our, our brains and unfortunately are our little unruly children and when we tell them to calm down they do the exact opposite <laughs> and it, it, it's 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 unfortunately just that's human nature that's just how we are and it's uh it, it's a challenge, but I, I think everyone has to come up with their own strategies and their own uh-huh. their own. Uh, you know, I, I can certainly tell people what I do, but what what I do is, is going to have little bearing for for sure. other people. So, um, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, it's a uh, it's it, it's a challenge, but it, but it's a it's a doable challenge, and and it's something that people have to figure out and work out. So where did this? Uh, I don't know if it's an old wives' tale or it's true, but you always hear about a glass of warm milk before bed. Well, first of all, it's not vegan, and you know, <laughs> the casein will cause cancer. And I'm like, I'm allergic to milk. But where where did that come about? Is it just the idea that it's warm, or is there something in milk that actually puts people to sleep? Seems to make babies sleep, at least breast milk. Yeah, uh, I, I can't. Uh, I, I I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Because so. I find a warm bath before bed really helps me sleep. Sometimes I actually fall asleep in the tub. So, you know. yeah, w- warm bath certainly. Warm, warm cup of of an herbal tea is something that I recommend to a lot of patients. So, a cup of chamomile tea. Um, th- there, there are a number of um, um, uh, um, herbal products or or, or plant based products that somebody could make a steeped tea from. That that in in Chinese tradition and, and alternative traditions are, are felt to be beneficial in terms of, of, of improving sleep and, and preventing and, and, and treating insomnia. So, you know, I, I think any of those are, are, are perfectly good choices. I, th- I think people really just have to approach sleep as it's not like turning off your computer. We push the off button and the computer shuts off. Mm-hmm. But that's not how our brain works. Our brain really needs a shutdown routine. Yeah. It, it takes a period of relaxation. It takes it, it takes a period of really kind of clearing your mind. It takes getting the temperature right. It takes getting it, it takes getting your body right, and, and and really putting yourself into that position that 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 you're optimized to get a good night's sleep. Is there a room temperature that's preferred for optimum sleep, in your opinion? Cooler. Cooler. You know, that's what we had a guest on the show, Ray Ray Cronice, who was a NASA scientist. He said that colder is better for sleep. Yeah. So it's interesting. And well, what happens that that really follows our own body's temperature because as the body falls asleep, our core body temperature actually dips down at nighttime, and then when we just before we wake up in the morning, body temperature actually rises again. So oh. what? So and and that's something that people will typically find that they will be oftentimes people are cold when they wake up because it's their body trying to warm up again. <laughs> And so cooler temperature when you're trying to initiate sleep and, and, and overnight while you're sleeping tends to be beneficial. Wow. So in regards to jet lag, do you recommend, just like you mentioned, that it's better to have set wake and sleep times even on the weekend that for those of us like myself that travel to different time zones every week that when we get there, we just pretend it's the time it is instead of yeah. trying to get on the, the time, you know, because it, I, I, it's so hard when I, you know, I just got back from Baltimore and it's easy coming home, but going there is 
terrible, you know, because these yeah. conferences start at 8 in the morning, but, you know, my body doesn't think it's 8 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it's tough, and, and, and there, there are no easy solutions for it. The, the body has a limited ability to adjust the circadian cycle from, from, from day to day. There's only so much that we're physiologically capable of advancing or delaying our circadian cycle from one day to the next. And, and, and the hard, cold fact of the matter is that if, if you travel to, to the East Coast or if you travel beyond the East Coast to Europe or, 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 or oh, yeah. you know, Japan was it, the, 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 the other side of the globe, you know, it, sure. it's, it's going to be tough. And, and yeah. unfortunately, just about the time that you're adjusted to the new time zone, it's time, to, go home. It's time to come back yeah. home. Exactly. It's exactly so. right. It's exactly right. You know, we've had some doctors on the show before, like Dr. Clapper and Dr. Goldhammer, that were talking about not eating late at night, not eating after dinner. And, and mainly they were saying this for weight loss, but for sleep, do you feel that there's, it's yeah. best to have several hours before eating and laying down to help your sleep? Well, in addition to weight loss, the, the the big thing that I find in a lot of people disrupts sleep is acid reflux. So mm-hmm. if, you have a, if you have a big fatty meal right before you go to bed, that fat is going to trigger a lot of acid production in your stomach. And when we're when we're upright, there is a vertical distance between between our stomach and our and our mouth. But as, as soon as we lay down, everything is flat. And, mm. and and you don't have gravity helping to keep acid down in your stomach. So so that acid is going to tend to kind of climb up out of the stomach, get up into the esophagus, get up into the throat, give us sore throats, give us heartburn, and so mm-hmm. forth. So, um, you know, I, I mean, I can recall some pretty miserable nights before I became plant-based where yeah. I went out to a nice restaurant and ate a big <laughs> fatty meal and, you know, big fatty dessert, and, and then I was up all night with, with, with heartburn. So. Oh, boy. Yeah. That's something. So if you don't mind, we just have a little bit of time left. I have a few questions from the listeners, and I understand you can't really give medical advice. They're not your patients. So feel free to not answer any question. But if you can maybe give like a general idea to some of these, that would be great. And if not, For it's sure. a good deal, okay? Because some sure. of them are kind of specific. And, and, and I want to say to that, I, you know, I have no way of knowing where these people live when they submit the questions. But I would like to say that if you do live in the Los Angeles area or want to travel, you can see Dr. Artal. His website is www.drartal.com. And he'd be happy to answer these questions in person. So as um we have a question that says, as an internal medicine specialist, how would you counsel a patient coming to you, I don't even know what this means, with positive DMPS-EDTA provocation tests, results for very high multiple heavy metal toxicities, including mercury, lead, gadolinium, cadmium, aluminum, antimony, tin, and uranium. Will weight loss potentially exacerbate the release of heavy metals from within the fat cells, thereby causing increased risk to body symptoms? Are you familiar with any of the combination MDs, NDs, specialized in treating heavy metal toxicity issues? That was very specific. So Yeah, you know, a pretty specific question. You know, unfortunately, that's not something that I, you know, can claim any any specific expertise in. I know that there are, uh, I, I have seen patients, um, uh, a handful of patients probably, gosh, I don't know, maybe a half dozen or a dozen over, over the couple decades or, or, or decade and a half that I've been in practice mm-hmm. um, who, who've, who've dealt with issues like that. And, and there are a, there's, there's a, there's, there seems to be a pretty small cohort of physicians around the country who, who, who have experience and expertise in those very kind of specialized fields. And, and, and I'm sure if you go on to some, some, some blogs on the net, you can find one of those folks. But uh, you know, and unfortunately, I, I can't claim yeah. much expertise. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought I'd ask just so that people know we really do ask your questions. <laughs> um, Patty writes that she has AFib and takes calcium, magnesium, and zinc. Some people think supplements are a bad idea. She's trying to get everything from her plant foods. She eats a lot but finds herself low in calcium by 30% according to the chronometer. Um, is that enough or do you think she should take calcium supplements? Well, um yeah. Again, I mean, that's a pretty specific right. question, you know, related to that to that concern. You know, I would say though that atrial fibrillation typically does have a number of triggers. Something that I see in in, in my practice, there's about a 60 to 70 percent correlation between the presence of atrial fibrillation and obstructive sleep apnea. So mm-hmm. there there are a lot of cardiologists who my in my neck of the woods who every time they see a patient with atrial fibrillation or diagnose them with sleep apnea. That, that triggers some sort of a sleep evaluation, whether it's a sleep questionnaire or a sleep study. Mm-hmm. But you, you know, you know, that's something to think about. I think uh, anytime somebody has atrial fibrillation, is it, what is the trigger? 
Right. Um, wh why do you have atrial fibrillation? I, th I think that's the question that I would be asking. Sure. Good, good. Well, that's very helpful. This is actually a specific sleep question from Janet. She says she's had sleep issues since she was a child. When she sleeps well, she feels great, as do I think all of us. She's been on a mixture of melatonin, L-tryptophan, L-theanine, and valerian root for the past few years. Found that she was so sleepy and drowsy for hours every morning into the afternoon and felt drugged. So she changed over to taking tart cherry capsule, 850 milligrams. It's been helpful. Right. No drowsiness in the morning, falls asleep almost as right. well at night. Wants to know if there's any other natural remedy she could consider to sleep better and stay asleep. Well, you, you've touched on a lot of the natural remedies that are that are touted as being beneficial for um, for sleep. Um, mm -hmm. um, some some others that that I've heard anecdotally. Again, I'm, I'm not sure what specific medical literature or evidence there is to support these. A lot of these are are, are um, in, in tradition rather than uh, r r rather than specifically scientifically studied, but lemon balm. Uh, I've, I've heard people uh, uh, making a tea from hops, uh, uh, but I think cherry tart is great, and that's something that I've recommended in the past. So oh, nice. Kudos to you for finding that, and it sounds like you're having a good result with that. So great. Terrific. This may not be something you know the answer to, but uh, Carlene wants to know about uh, her hypothyroidism, if she, about iodine supplementation, if she should be taking it, and how much. That might not be something you can address, but I thought I'd ask. Yeah, I mean, if if you're if you're plant based, um, mm -hmm. uh, um, iodine deficiency potentially could be an issue um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of how much iodine you're getting in. So, so that's something that can be. That, that can be tested for to, to, to look at your iodine levels if that's a specific concern of yours. Things that you can do to counteract that or, or to try to eat more sea-based vegetables or to, to eat sea vegetables. Yeah, I, I love dulse. They make a smoke because I, I actually was, I'm hypothyroid, I actually was iodine deficient and I do eat dulse now and it's delicious. Yeah, it, for sure. It's it's very delicious and it, and it's just it's just a different variety and 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 the and the veggies that we eat. So I, so I think that's great. So so you can speci you can specifically test for iodine and that's something that you can discuss with your physician and mm -hmm. and and if and if it turns out that you are iodine deficient there there, there are different ways of dealing with that. So um, Great. So the last question is from our mutual friend, Lisa. She's asking on her behalf of her 45-year-old cousin, who is a nuclear medicine radiologist in Virginia, who's vegan except for a weekly Shabbat with salmon dinner. Newsflash, right. he's not vegan then. <laughs> he's a vegetarian. He is concerned because his total cholesterol is 231 and LDL is 136, and his hydroxyvitamin D is 12. What would be the strategy well. you would recommend to decrease his risk and improve his health? Well, you, you know, it, it's interesting, and 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 no, um, with no small thanks to you, AJ, I, I do have a lot of uh, vegans in my practice that that, that, <laughs> that, that I take care of. But you're not because they're never sick. That's right. <laughs> for, for for internal medicine, and you know, it, it's interesting. You know, you know, we we most of the vegans have very low cholesterol levels and and very favorable um, lipid profiles, but 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 there are several hard hardened meticulous, faithful vegans who have um, significantly elevated cholesterols. And clearly there's a genetic influence in addition to a dietary influence. Um, uh, you know, again, I, I don't want to give specific advice, but uh, not all hyperlipidemia, not all uh, elevated cholesterol is, is going to be nutrition and, and diet related. And, mm -hmm. and, and it could be that your relative um, uh, um, that these are just the genetic influences that are that are um, uh, provoking uh, or, or, or leading to an elevated lipid profile. Um, other dietary factors can lead to elevated cholesterol, including um, having a lot of fat or a lot of oily foods. So, if you're a, a vegan that tends to eat a lot of fried foods, that could certainly push somebody to have a, a um, uh, an, ele an elevated cholesterol level. So, so those are all things that I think have to be looked at and have to be discussed with with their physician. Interesting. You know, um, you actually are a really good cook from what I understand. And one of my favorite recipes, which I tell everybody about, is the uh, the Brussels sprouts. And so tell us a little bit, because you, you don't just tell people to eat healthy. You actually do eat healthy. And you don't just tell people to exercise. You actually do exercise. And you, you even exercised when you were heavier and not even vegan. So that's, right. that's excellent. Um, so can you just quickly just say kind of like what you eat and what you do kind of every day just to show people that, hey, you're not just um, telling them to do it. You, you really do this yourself. 
Sure. So, you know, I try, I try to start most days by waking up at about 5 o'clock in the morning to, to go for, for a run or for a swim. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I probably swim about three or four mornings a week and, and try to go running a couple mornings a week. This morning was a run. And I, 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 get to the, I get to the hospital, I make my hospital rounds, and then I get to my office, and I'll typically have a large bowl of oatmeal with about a cup or half a cup of blueberries and a tablespoon of flaxseed, ground flaxseed, and, and, uh, and, and that's my breakfast basically every day. And then lunch basically every day is a, is a huge bowl of a, of a bean stew that I make once or twice a week. Um, I, I bring this food in from home every day. So, you know, it definitely requires some preparation and some planning. Otherwise, you're relegated to, to getting food from the local restaurant. And, um, uh, and, and then dinner is going to be you know, you know, big salad or some veggies, some, some steamed rice, you know, wh- whatever, whatever my wife and I kind of figure out to, to, to feed us and the troops. So uh, dinner is a little bit of a potpourri, but my breakfasts and lunches are, are pretty consistent each and every day. Right. Well, speaking of the troops, um, how how successful have you been in getting them to adopt a more healthful diet? Yeah, I know you have three kids, three sons. Yeah, yeah you know, it's it's a uh, it, it, it's, it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I won't um, uh, I, I won't uh, you know mince that part of it. They're they're not vegan. I, I don't enforce that on them, um, but I, I certainly try to encourage them to eat healthy. And and because of the choices that I make and and, and what what I prepare at home, they um, I think eat a lot healthier than a lot of their peers. They're, sure. they're certainly exposed to a lot of plant-based foods, and 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 my hope is that growing up, watching how their how their parents eat, watching how their dad eats, that they're going to absorb some of that and and hopefully make good choices in their life. That's great. That's terrific. Well, last question I'm going to ask you, Dr. Artel, has really nothing to do with about eating, but I always like to know. Who inspired you in life? And it doesn't have to be like a doctor or plant-based, but just in general, like who inspired you? Well, I became a doctor because my um, uh, fa- my father's mother um, always encouraged me to be a doctor, and she always would talk to me about how she she grew up in Europe and lived in in, in Europe about how. Uh, cherished physicians were in the local village in the local town that it was that it was the most blessed that it, that it was the most blessed of, of professions to, to help another human being to help another person that there was really nothing more more sacred than that and and that's a um, a spirit that she really instilled in me and, and that's what I try to carry with carry with me when I when I see patients well, and you are, you are a wonderful doctor. And I say that not just from talking to you because I, you know, I actually see you and so does my husband. And we just think you're terrific. And if you guys would like to see Dr. Artal, his website is www.drartal, D-R-A-R-T-A-L. He walks the talk. He doesn't just tell you to eat healthy and exercise and use good sleep hygiene. He actually does it himself. It's just been such a pleasure. It's just, I, I've learned so much talking to you. I think this is just a fascinating subject that's really not talked about a lot. And so I appreciate you uh, enlightening us on this. Thank you, Ajay. My pleasure. And before we go, I have, I have to give you a plug. Oh, cool. So, so, for, so for those of you who don't live in Los Angeles, AJ puts on wonderful programs and cooking classes and seminars and for any of you who are considering coming to Los Angeles or, or spending a weekend in Los Angeles or a week in Los Angeles, check out AJ's website and coordinate it with one of her, yeah. with one of the programs that she puts on. I've, I've, I've participated in your programs, AJ, both as a as a participant as well as a um, as well as a guest lecturer. And, right. And, and, and you're phenomenal. And okay. and you are my inspiration too. I mean, you, you, you are. I mean, talk about walk the walk and talk the talk. Aww. I mean, I mean, you have inspired and touched the lives of so many people. Aww. Literally hundreds and hundreds of people well, if not thank thousands you. thank you so much and thank you always for supporting our event specifically healthy taste of la it's it's so nice of you to come there and the next one actually we're taking this year off is next year january 17th sunday 2016 we're having it at the sheraton universal so you can bring the kids they can go to city walk and they can do the universal studios tour and our keynote awesome. speaker is dr esselson so thank you so much for saying that and thank you so much for your time dr artal and thank all of you so much for listening to healthy living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Good night, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Artel. Thank you. Good night. Good night.